Part two of Chapter twenty four of The Dude Wrangler by Caroline Lockhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter twenty four, Part two. But Mrs. Apple was obdurate, declaring that she did not care to take the responsibility of leaving her without a proper chaperon since aunt lizzie was too unworldly to be a safe guardian and miss heister was herself unmarried miss gaskett was compelled to succumb to the argument and the three were driven to the nearest hotel after luncheon leaving wallie and pinky with the sickening knowledge that now it was not possible to break even to say nothing of a profit every day they were out would put them in debt a little deeper but they both were agreed they would finish the trip whatever happened the evening was a gloomy one as compared to others and although they built a campfire as usual there was none of the customary gaiety around it mr stott sat alone on his saddle blanket lost in meditation of a sombre nature and pinky and miss heister whispered apart wallie was in no mood for conversation while mr hicks with the delicacy which now marked his every action smoked alone in the shadow making no effort to intrude himself upon his betters even red mcgonagall reclining on his elbow staring into the embers seemed pensive and disinclined to take advantage of the opportunity which the silence gave him to hear his own voice so only aunt lizzie philbrick remained to give life to the party and aunt lizzie while a woman of high principle and fine character was admittedly not stimulating aunt lizzie had snow-white hair drawn tightly from her forehead and a corpse-like pallor to match it she could not possibly look any different in her coffin because so far as appearances went she might have been dead for a decade her manner was helpless her voice gentle and hesitating while in repose she ordinarily gave the impression of being in a state of suspended animation but to-night she was strangely restless her thin white hands fluttered nervously and she moved her camp chair so often that every one wondered silently what was the matter with her there was a red spot on either cheek which might have been the heat of the fire or excitement at any rate it was plain to the least observant that aunt lizzie was perturbed by something finally during one of her frequent movings she inadvertently set the leg of her camp chair in a hole and went over backward mr hicks who bounded from the shadow was the first to reach her and every one was astonished to hear her cry when he would have assisted her don't touch me every one felt rather sorry for hicks when he returned to his seat crestfallen while aunt lizzie went off at a stiff-legged trot to her teepee without saying good-night to anybody when some extraordinary accident was not befalling aunt lizzie who seemed the essence of mediocrity she was always doing the unexpected so little was thought of it after the first surprise at her rudeness and the others shortly said good-night and retired also wallie stood alone by the dying campfire wondering what the morrow might hold for him if any bad luck could come that had not already happened if so he could not imagine it for it seemed he had run the gamut of misfortune in this he was mistaken for when they stopped at noonday he received a blow from the last quarter he had expected aunt lizzie the day had not begun too auspiciously for when something like two miles on their journey mr stott remembered that he had left his soap on a rock and since it was expensive soap felt he must return for it he had galloped the distance and back again joining the party with his horse sweating and wallie had warned him curtly that the day promised to be a hot one and he must ride slowly please do not get ahead of the grub wagon wallie had said with emphasis mr stott had done as requested just so long as it suited him and then 
passing Wallie with a little laugh of defiance, had raced to lead the procession. In consequence, when Hicks pulled to the roadside for lunch somewhat earlier than usual, Mr. Stott did not know it and continued riding. The heat was terrific, and animals and humans suffered alike, while the gypsum dust, which rose in clouds, added to the discomfort. Gnats and mosquitoes, deer flies and no seams, attacked in clouds, and as viciously as if they had double rows of teeth and rapiers. It was the most unpleasant day they had encountered. Everyone's nerves were on edge, and there has been more gaiety in a mourner's carriage than in the Surrey, where Red tried vainly to interest Aunt Lizzie. Wallie was too angry with Mr. Stott to care for luncheon, so after a bite he betook himself to the shade of a tree and sat down to smoke with his back against it. He was thinking of the buckskin and how jaded it had looked that morning and wondering if its already stiffened shoulders would get over it if he pulled off its shoes and turned it into a soft pasture. His speculations were interrupted by Aunt Lizzie, who stood before him twisting her fingers in embarrassment. A peerless beauty could not have passed unscathed through such a morning, but the havoc it had wrought in Aunt Lizzie's looks was nothing short of startling. Her lids were inflamed and swollen from the bites of the noceums. Her nose was red, and her eyes watered from the gypsum dust, which affected her like hay fever. Her sailor hat had slipped to the back of her head, and her scolding locks were hanging like a fringe over a soiled linen collar. One would have said that Aunt Lizzie could have traversed the earth unmolested, not accepting the bandits because of whom she had fled Mexico. Something of the sort passed through Wallie's mind as he waited the explanation of her obvious confusion. I have something very awkward to say to you, Wallie. The harried expression, which was becoming chronic, leapt into his eyes at the introduction, as he asked himself what now might be portending. It's rather indelicate to discuss with the gentleman, she continued, braiding her fingers. Wallie was alarmed, but... Anxious to set her at her ease, he said encouragingly, You can talk as freely to me as if I were your father. He had not had time to visualize himself as Aunt Lizzie's father when she went on in a short-breathed fashion. I fear that I shall have to leave you, Wallie, as soon as possible. Wallie's wonder grew, but he said nothing. I think, I, I fear, I believe, she stammered, that Mr. Hicks is of a very ardent temperament. Wallie could not have spoken now had he wanted to. Since yesterday, I have found him looking at me frequently in a peculiar manner. Last night, he stared at me with his burning eyes until I could feel his hypnotic influence i hope i trust you will believe i have not given him any encouragement wallie's jaw which had fallen prevented him from reassuring her that he believed her blameless so far the tongue of scandal has never laid hands on me she declared mixing her metaphors in her agitation but i feel that it is a risk I should not take to travel about the country with a company of men and only an unmarried woman in the party. Wallie managed to mumble. You are as safe here as if you were in a convent, Aunt Lizzie. It would have seemed from her expression that she preferred not to think so. However, you understand how I feel, don't you? she pleaded. Perfectly, perfectly, Wallie replied, two days to make any other answer. He would have been only a little less 
astounded if the old lady had announced her intention of opening a dance-hall upon her return to Prouty. Aunt Lizzie's desertion, and for such a reason, was the last thing he had anticipated. It seemed like the final straw laid upon a back already breaking. He watched her toddle away and sat down again gloomily. At the supply wagon, Mr. Hicks was putting the food away, commenting profanely upon the flies, the heat, the tardiness of Mr. Stott, the injustice of things in general, and, in particular, the sordid necessity which obliged him to occupy this humble position when he was so eminently fitted to fill a higher one. He threw a stick at a camp robber that had flown down and taken a pick at a plate on a stump which contained the lunch he had saved for Mr. Stock, and his expression was so diabolic that it was the first time for many days that he looked natural. Red McGonagall, with his hat over his face, dozed in the shade of the bed wagon. Aunt Lizzie busied herself with preparations for departure. Miss Eyster perused the testimonials for a patent medicine contained in a pamphlet left by previous campers. Insects droned, heat waves shimmered, the horses stood sleeping in their nose bags. It was a peaceful noonday scene, but MacPherson and company, now sitting on their heels discussing their prospects, or lack of them, had no eye for it. One thought was uppermost. Their bubble was punctured. They were worse than ruined, for their horses and outfit were mortgaged almost up to their value, and, in addition, they had borrowed at the bank, counting on paying off all their indebtedness when the park trip was finished. I suppose I can get a job herding sheep. There's money in it. But I'll be an old man before I can afford to get married, to say nothing of the disgrace of it. Pinky's voice sounded hopeless. The plank gave Wally such a pang that he could not answer, but with a twig played a game of tic-tac-toe in the dust, while he thought bitterly that no one could blame Helene Spensley for preferring Canby to a person who seemed destined to failure in whatever he attempted. He was another of the four-fleshers, he told himself, and the country was full of them, who just fell short of doing something and being somebody. Probably, in time, he would have no ambition beyond working for a grub stake in summer so he could shack up in winter. He would let his hair grow and go sockless and buy new clothes rather than wash his old ones and eat from soiled dishes and read mail order catalogues for entertainment and doggone it why couldn't he bring himself to think of marrying some respectable girl like the blacksmith's daughter there in prouty who had no chin and a fine complexion and cooked like an angel and never said a cross word to anybody since wallie was too uncommunicative to be interesting pinky got up and left him to his reflections remarking philosophically as he departed to join miss eyster well i never heard of anybody being hanged for owing money so i guess there's no use in us going around with the double-breasted blues over it we might as well whistle and say we like it wally looked after his partner almost angrily oh yes it was well enough for him to talk about being cheerful and not worrying but he guessed he would not be so chipper and so easily resigned to disappointment if he had nothing more to which to look forward than he had the lugubrious voice of mr hicks declaiming reached him come fill the cup and in the fire of spring your winter garment of repentance fling the bird of time has but a little way to flutter and the bird is on the wing that was the worst of it wally thought despairingly the bird of time had but a little way to flutter he was so old twenty-seven the realization that he was still a failure at this advanced age increased his misery he was a fool to go on hoping that he meant anything to helene spensley or ever would but just the same wally 
stood up and squared his shoulders. If he couldn't have the woman he wanted, there wouldn't be any other. He would sell his place for what he could get for it, pay his debts, and go to Tahiti and be a beachcomber, or to Guatemala and start a revolution, or live a hermit in the Arctic Circle, trapping for a fur company. He would do whatever he could to forget her. Then, suddenly, he wished that he was a little boy again, and could sit on Aunt Mary's lap and lay his head on her shoulder the way he used to, when he came home from school with a sick headache. It always had comforted him. A heartache was worse than a headache by a whole lot. Somehow, he was so lonely, so inexpressibly lonely. He had not felt like this even that first winter on his homestead. A lump rose in his throat to choke him, and he was about to turn away lest someone see the mist in his eyes that blinded him, and that he felt horribly ashamed of, when the sound of hoofs attracted his attention and caused him to grow alert in an instant. He was sure that it was Stott returning, and then he caught a glimpse of him through the trees, galloping. "'Oh, here you are!' exclaimed that person, irritably, as he turned off the road and came through the brush toward Wally. There was a bright shine in Wally's eyes as he walked toward him. "'Why didn't you tell me you were going to camp in the middle of the morning?' Stock demanded it in his rasping voice as he dismounted. Wally returned evenly. "'You know, as well as I do, that choosing a camp is left to Hicks' judgment. I told you not to get ahead of the supply wagon.' If you think I'm going to poke along behind like a snail, you're mistaken, Stott retorted. Wally's face went white under its tan, though his voice was quiet enough as he answered. You'll poke this afternoon, I'm thinking. Stott turned sharply. What do you mean by that? Just what I said. Look at that horse. The buckskin's head was hanging, its legs were trembling, there was not a dry hair on it, and the sweat was running in rivulets. Its sides were swollen at the stirrup where the spurs had pricked it, and the corners of its mouth were raw and bleeding. Wally continued, and his voice now was savage. You're one of the people, and there's plenty like you, that ought to be prevented by law from owning either a horse or a gun. This afternoon, you'll ride in the Surrey, or walk, as suits you. Stott laughed insolently. Oh, I guess not. Wally calmly loosened the latigo. Stott took a step toward him with his heavy jaw thrust out, and his hand sought his hip pocket. Don't you take the saddle off that horse. His tone was menacing. A machine that had been purring in the distance passed, slowed up, and stopped a little way beyond the camp. Wally heard it, but did not look to see whom it might be bringing. As an answer to Stott's threat, he dropped the cinch and laid his hand upon the horn. If you think I'm bluffing... For answer, Wally pulled off the saddle. Stott hesitated for the fraction of a second, then his arm shot out, and Wally dropped heavily from the blow beneath the ear which Stott dealt him. There was a sharp cry behind him, but Wally did not look around as, still dazed, he got to his feet slowly with his eyes upon his antagonist. I warned you, Stott chortled, and he put his hand behind him to conceal the brass knuckles he was wearing. Helene Spensley was there, her voice had told him, but he took no account of that in the choking, blinding rage which now controlled him. Before Stop could use his cowardly weapon again, Wally sprang for him, and with the force and rapidity of a trained fighter landed blow after blow on the heavy jaw which made a fine target. You horse killer! You braggart and sheepskate! You shyster and ambulance chaser! 
and with every epithet Wallie landed a punch that made the lawyer stagger. It was not nice language. It was not a nice thing to do, possibly, and perhaps the soft answer would have been better, but the time had passed when Wallie set any store by being merely nice, and he had forgotten Helene Spensley's presence, though in any event it would have made no difference. There was only one thought in his mind as he sat astride Stott's chest when Stott went down finally, and that was to make him say, Enough, if he had to hammer him past recognition. This did not require so long as one would have thought, considering that person's boasts as to his courage, but at that Stott might well be excused for wishing to end the punishment he was receiving. In the face above him, almost brutal in the fury that stamped it, there was no trace to remind Stott of the youth who had painted cabbage roses in knit sweaters. "'Let me up!' he cried, finally, struggling under the merciless blows that rained upon him. "'Say it!' Wally's voice was implacable. "'Nuff!' Stott whined it. Wally stopped immediately and the attorney got to his feet, sullen and humiliated. He stood for a moment, rubbing his neck and eyeing Wally, then, with a return of defiance, flung at him. "'You'll pay for this, young fellow!' Wally's short laugh was mocking. Huh, "'Why don't you sue me for damages? I'd be flattered to death at the implication that I had any money. It might help my credit.' With a shrug, he turned and walked toward Helene Spensley. Her eyes were shining, and there was a singular smile on her face as he went up to her, but whether she smiled or frowned did not seem to matter much to Wallie. He was not a pretty sight at the moment, and he knew it. A lump had risen on his jaw, and one eye was closing. His hair was powdered with gypsum dust, and the sleeve of his shirt was torn out at the shoulder. But he had no apologies to make for anything, and there was that in his manner which said so. Helene laughed as she put out her hand to him. Was that a part of the regular program, or an impromptu feature of the day's entertainment? It's been brewing, Wally replied briefly. Aren't you surprised to see me? Not particularly. Or glad? I'm always that. This came yesterday while I was in Prouty, and I volunteered to deliver it. I thought it might be important. She handed him a telegram. That was good of you. His face softened a little, and still more as he read the message. He passed it to Helene. Will you come home if I tell you I was wrong and want you? Aunt Mary. Wally mused softly. It must have been hard for her to write that. Will you go? Helene asked quickly. Wally did not answer. He stood motionless, staring at the road where the heat waves shimmered, his absent gaze following a miniature cyclone that picked up and whirled a little cloud of powdered gypsum while Helene waited. Her eyes were upon his face with an expression that would have arrested his attention if he had seen it but he seemed to have forgotten her and her question. When he spoke, finally, it was to himself, rather, as if in denunciation of the momentary temptation which the telegram had been to him. No, emphatically. I'm not going back like a prodigal who can't stand the gaff any longer. I won't slink into a soft berth because it's offered and admit that I'm not man enough to stand up and take what comes to me. I'm licked, again, proper, and, harshly, I don't expect anybody to believe in me, but I won't stay licked, if I can help it. I'm said to be a good picker, and I've always believed in you, Wallace McPherson, Helene said, slowly. He stared his incredulity, then replied with ungracious irony, You've concealed it well. Flattery is bad for growing boys, she smiled mischievously. I'm sure you've never spoiled anyone by it, 
You've treated me like a hound, mostly. Her eyes sparkled as she answered. I like hounds, if they have metal. Even when they run themselves down following a cold trail, he asked in self-derision. Her reply was interrupted by voices raised in altercation in the vicinity of the supply wagon. A clump of bushes concealed the disputants, but they easily recognized the rasping nasal tones of Mr. Stott and the menacing bellow peculiar to the cook in moments of excitement. The wrangle ended abruptly, and while Helene and Wally stood wondering as to what the silence meant, Pinky, with a wry smile upon his face, came toward them. "'Well, I guess we're out of the dude business,' he said laconically. "'What's the matter now?' Wally demanded so savagely that the two burst out laughing. "'Nothing much, except that Hicks is running start with the butcher knife and aims to kill him. I don't know as I blame him.' He said his grub was full of ants and looked like scraps for Fido. Wally was alarmed, but Pinky reassured him. Don't worry, he won't catch him, unless he's got wings. The gate stop was traveling. He'll be at the hotel in about twenty minutes. It's only five miles. What do you make of this, partner? Pinky handed him a worn and grimy envelope as he added an explanation. I found it stuck in the cupboard of the wagon. Wally took the envelope, wondering grimly as he turned it over if there was anything left that could surprise him. There was. On the back was written, Ellery Hicks, insulted, August 3rd, this year of our Lord, 1920. Below, in pencil, was a list of the party, with every name crossed out save Mr. Stott's, and at the bottom, ornamented with many curlicues and beautifully shaded, was the significant sentence, with the date as yet blank. Ellery Hicks avenged August blank this year of our Lord, 1920. End of Part 2, Chapter 24